We begin with the U.S. men's national team, who last night captured their third straight CONCACAF Nations League title, beating Mexico 2-0 in the final. The goals, Tyler Adams late in the first half, Gio Reyna in the second half. The U.S. now unbeaten in their last seven games against Mexico, five wins and two draws. All right, can I preface our conversation here, Mossy? Because there is a sentiment out there, I'm sure, that people that um, believe that talking about this uh, it's very easy to lose perspective. I want to make sure that everybody understands what we're about to do here on the State of the Union. We're not breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back for beating Mexico, and by the way, beating Mexico yet again. But this is a trophy. This is a moment of celebration. This is a moment where the music and the confetti and the raising of the trophy happens. That is important. I think that is worthy of ce celebration. This is also a comprehensive win against our biggest rival within CONCACAF in what has to be said was a hostile environment down there in Arlington, uh, Texas, where, you know, whatever, 60,000 fans, and they were obviously there to see Mexico. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of love again to AO, the American outlaws out there, and they did the best that they could. Um, so we will, I think, fairly and rightfully so, celebrate this win. And then... I think whether it's the players, Greg Berhalter, or any of us on the outside, get back to the work at hand and recognize and respect that there are bigger fish to fry. Having said that, this, as I said, was a comprehensive win. Congratulations to Greg Berhalter and to this team. I think that the, watching this game in that 90 minutes, there was no doubt as to who the better team was individually in terms of the talent and collectively in terms of a, of a team. And they smashed our rivals, Mexico, yet again. Dos a cero. It never gets old. If it gets old, then something is wrong. We might talk a little bit about that rivalry uh, and where it's going and that pendulum that we talk about a lot right now. But certainly, this is, at least for me, cause for celebration with perspective. Uh, first off, I want to give a shout out to Chris Whittingham, who I thought did a great job calling both U.S. matches alongside Tony Miola. He has a very distinct voice that you couldn't mistake for anybody else. <laughs> You're being so facetious there. You want to explain to the folks? I mistakenly referred to him as Dre Cordero on our last podcast, which yes, Tony my, Miola let me know about. My good friend Tony Miola uh, was was very quick to say, hey, uh, not for nothing. <laughs> but um, And so we have, cor we have corrected that. Congratulations to Chris and Tony. I th actually think that they did a... Uh, um, a really good job. All right, listen, uh, Mossy, can I uh, can I take you through the 11 and just some real thoughts on what's what's happening? Or you wanted to say something before? I just want to get one big picture okay. thought in there. Uh, I feel like we had this exact conversation last year after the U.S. beat Mexico 3-0 in the Nations League semis. The gap between these two teams right now is huge to the point where Mexico is the one that tries to muck up the game while the U.S. is the one that tries to play. And a pretty good 7 out of 10 performance is now enough to beat Mexico comfortably. That's where we are in this rivalry. Uh, I have some thoughts on how we ended up there, but you know, I think people are gonna have to wrap their heads around the fact that Mexico is no longer a barometer for the US. Yes, these games have extra juice. Yes, it's more satisfying to beat Mexico than it is to beat a Jamaica or Panama. But from a technical standpoint, if the goal is people like you keep saying over the next couple of years is to become an elite team that can arrive at the next World Cup feeling like a legitimate contender to win it, then Mexico is no longer a litmus test in that regard. Okay. So you're doing exactly what I just told you we weren't going to do. <laughs> <laughs> you're such a grouch. And again, it doesn't mean that you're being delusional or Pollyanna in the way that we are, we're talking about it to celebrate this win. All right, when I go through the 11, uh, Matt Turner, I don't think, I, I think reestablished himself as the number one, but to your point, was not tested a whole lot and obviously let in a goal in the first uh, seven seconds. And as you mentioned in a previous pod, there were some shaky moments, especially with him playing uh, out of the back. But again, this is a guy who is not playing. We'll get into that in a second. Serginho Dest comes back into the fold on that right back position. I think Serginho Dest approached this game as an opportunity to create, create as much content for the gram as possible because the stuff that he was doing was wonderful and it was beautiful and it was audacious um, and it was, it, it, was, it was great to see. And from a viral perspective, I'm sure that his Instagram feed is now full uh, of moments. It is a roller coaster with him though because yep. defensively, some of the lapses that play in the second half where he let Henry Martin push him off the ball in the box and get a shot off. I mean, that can't happen. My, 
<laughs> yeah, you take the good with the bad when it comes to Sergio Dest. And I think that there is more good uh, than bad. However, you know, I was talking to my brother last night and it's, it, it's not good in the bad. It's, it's great or bad. And <laughs> there's very little in between. Um, if we, guys, we go down the line, Chris Richards got the start uh, again. I still don't think that he is good enough. I still have not seen enough uh, from him. From a defensive standpoint, I think he's shaky. He doesn't give a whole lot going, uh, going forward. So I think the jury is still out when it comes to him. Tim Ream came back in and just showed what a mature, evolved, playmaking type of center back is and how important he is in a situation like this. And I'll just reference back to what we said earlier uh, on, the, uh, on the pod last week. This is a very different type of team that the U.S. was facing in that Mexico wasn't going to go into a shell and defend like Jamaica. And so there was much more space for the talent to do what they needed to do and for uh, the ball handling, whether it's Tim Reen or anybody else out there, to have that time and space to do it. Anthony Robson, I think, was much better uh, in this game. Weston McKinney is such an interesting player. I, I, I love him. I thought that his confidence and his swagger out there was the best part of when he had the ball. He believed, and he made me believe that he was not going to lose it. And that was important. Tyler Adams goes without saying, you come in, you only play 45 minutes, but you score a, a crucial goal and one that nobody would have predicted he would have scored. But more importantly, his leadership and the, the impact that his presence on the field cannot be overstated. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Uh, Reina, let me come back to Reina. I did not think that Timmy Weah had a good window. Uh, I did not think that Yunus Musa, who, by the way, didn't start, uh, had a g good window. And maybe there are extenuating circumstances when it comes to Ramadan and, and the fasting and all that. Um, Haji Wright, I think, showed that he was okay, but not great. And I, I don't think anybody has changed anybody's mind in that that number nine position still remains wide open. It's a pity that we didn't get to see Josh Sargent in this, uh, in this window. Christian Pulisic, I thought, was arguably the best player over these, uh, over these two games. But I know really when it comes to what we're talking about here, it's Gio Reyna, Gio Reyna starting and Gio Reyna, Reyna having a consistent positive impact uh, on this team. Mossy. And doing it in front of his parents who were in attendance. That was great. That was great TV work to, for the camera to go and show Claudio and uh, Danielle up there in the stands given all of the drama and what has uh, played out over the last year and a half. All right, two big picture thoughts on the starting lineup. Haji Wright's trajectory is fascinating to me. The guy barely plays in the lead up to the World Cup and then ends up going to Qatar and being on the field for the most pivotal moments of that campaign. Then he seemingly drops out of the picture again. He wasn't in the original squad for these games, which contained three center forwards. He was not one of them, but he ends up starting the final against Mexico. And I do think uh, Balogun has run out of rope as far as being the default starter. Now, he's obviously still in the mix. I think he's the most talented player in that mix. So my money is on him re-emerging as a starter. But I do think it was notable that in a final against Mexico, Balogun and Pepe both available. Neither one started. Haji Wright did. So to your point, that center forward position is wide open. Wide open. Again, the next games for the U.S. are against Colombia and Brazil right before the Copa America. I have no idea who's going to start up front in those games. Do you think that had Haji Wright not come on and scored those two goals against Jamaica, that he would have been starting this game? Uh, no, I think that's what got him in the starting lineup. Okay. All right. I mean, well, and, and we talked about the difference between coming on as a sub and actually starting. And, and he wasn't horrible. There were a couple offside that I, I was scratching my head at. But, yeah, I, you know, just go back to what you said. It's still wide open right now. And then my second big picture point is we've been talking about it. The U.S. has six starters for five positions, those two wing positions and the three in the midfield, Adams, McKinney, Musa, Reina, Pulisic, Wea. And there was going to come a day when everybody was going to be available and it was going to be an important match and someone was going to be the odd man out and it was Musa. Now, maybe it had to do with Ramadan, but I do find it interesting that because of his indifferent season with AC Milan and his recent games for the U.S. haven't been that great, I didn't notice a lot of controversy on X over Musa not starting that game. Could you see this as being permanent, where he becomes more of a backup for the U.S., and is that odd man out? Only because it specifically relates to Gio Reyna, and so many people want Gio Reyna to be on the field. And, and again, against a different opponent, you know, while Mexico certainly believes that and, and showed that they want to play and they're not going to bunker in or anything like that. That's, this is also a very different proposition than coming up against the Netherlands. And so, uh, yeah, I think the, the equation in Greg Berhalter's head changes dramatically relative to the, uh, the opponent, but here 
you know, he knew the U.S. was going to have the ball. He knew the, there were going to be spaces. And Giorena had played well in the previous game. And so starting him, I think, I think made sense, especially given the fact that Musa had not played well. And the fact that Adams had 45 minutes in him and Greg Berhalter opted to go with him in the first half rather than the second half to kind of set the tone is interesting. Had he not scored that goal and we had gone in nil-nil and then he comes off at the half and Johnny comes in, we might be having a different conversation today about that decision. But the fact that he scored that goal makes it seem like a brilliant move. Okay, so let's get down to uh, Berhalter here. Um, you, would, I, you were really, really good uh, in our spaces. And if you didn't listen to it, it's in your feed. Um, talking about the negativity and the criticism and or, I mean, it's a harsh word, but the hate relative to Greg Berhalter. And that there are the never Gregors out there. And your point was, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, that if you, if you didn't think Greg Berhalter should have been the coach after the World Cup, then nothing is going to change your mind, and that's just the way, way that it is. But when it comes to Greg Berhalter, it has to be said, people scream and yell about what he isn't doing, or he's not making enough changes, or he's not adjusting, uh, or he's not playing X player or X player. and then. In this, a final, when he does adjust and does play different people and does have, you know, Gio Reyna or, you know, a controversial type of uh, selection where he plays Tyler Adams and starts him there. And it goes well, and not just goes well, goes really, really well individually for the players and the team collectively in terms of the result and the overall performance. Well, that's just because he's been given the greatest uh, collection of talent of any coach in history. So he can't win. To all you Burhalter haters out there, just sheathe those knives for now. Don't worry. Don't worry. Fear not. You are going to get an opportunity because summer is coming. All right. Another chance for you to plunge those knives deep into Greg Burhalter and bathe in that shot of Froyua is going to come soon enough. But until then, as I mentioned at the top of the show, just relax and enjoy another win over Mexico. Because as I said, it never, ever gets old. And again, we are approaching this with, uh, with perspective. But even in the, uh, in the post-game uh, show, the way that it was framed was, okay, yeah, but this is just Mexico. Okay, yeah, but Greg Berhalter really didn't do anything. And look, I, I, I got a lot of respect uh, for Jesse Marsh for what he has done. Uh, and he wasn't the only one, but a lot of people in particular were pointing out the way that Gio Reyna was playing and dropping deep to get the ball. And whether that was a tactical decision or whether that was just the flow of the game. Well, first off, if you ever kick the ball, and certainly Jesse Marsh and everybody else uh, on that panel and around the uh, world, I'm assuming you've kicked the ball at some point. You've been in a game where a center midfielder, a creative type, has wanted to get the ball. Now, it does drive me crazy when midfielders come back and take the ball off of center back's feet, but I understand why they do it. They want to get on the ball. They want to be involved. And they are in there to run the show. And Gio Reyna was in there to run the show. But I just thought it was kind of nitpicking. And I didn't think that it was, I didn't think it made the point that people wanted to make to go and say, well, why is Gio Reyna showing up in strange places as opposed to getting closer to the goal. Well, one of the reasons is we want him to have the ball, and he was looking to actually get the ball. Musk. And again, on Greg Berhalter, you can either live in the world as it is or the world that you think it should be. And the world as it is is that Matt Crocker really likes Greg Berhalter clearly mm -hmm. and thinks he did a good job in the last cycle, which is why he rehired him. And the players really like Greg Berhalter. You saw what Yunus Musa said before these games. You saw what Tyler Adams said after the game last night, lavishing praise on Berhalter. So clearly the threshold of how much it's going to take for him to lose his job is higher than fans on X think it should be. You and I have talked about it. I think it would take a catastrophic Copa America campaign, an embarrassing group stage exit. If he gets out of that group, which does contain Panama and Bolivia, and whatever happens in a knockout stage, I think he's fine and he'll keep going after that. So fans just better reconcile themselves to that. <laughs> Can I read you a little quote from, uh, from Greg Berhalter? Um, Doug McIntyre put this out here on X uh, when he was asked, when Greg Berhalter was asked, or sorry, Tyler Adams was asked about Greg Berhalter. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he, 
uh, Tyler Adams talking about Greg Berhalter, he's doing more for us as a country in developing us as young players than people see, obviously, on the field. It's not easy to come into camp and have two days to train. Some guys played 90 minutes and get in the day before the game and have to play again. So this camp was a success. And I think we need to continue to have more moments like this. To your point, uh, and then he also said, what are you as fans or press judging him off of? You know what I mean, question mark? We continue to win in certain situations. Our first World Cup experience was a positive in a lot of people's minds. He's, Greg Berhalter, is developing us in the right way. He's having conversations with us off the pitch that are continually developing us. And most importantly, he's challenging us. Now, this is a Greg Berhalter who also in the postgame conference said that he got into a fight with Tyler Adams, you know, a, a shouting match with Tyler Adams because Tyler Adams wanted to continue on and not just play 45 minutes. We saw Tyler Adams come off the field and them get into it on the on the uh, sideline out there. But to your point, these these players seem to have a respect and a fondness and do like Greg Berhalter. And I know those will say, well, yeah, if if he's starting them and he's giving them times on time on the field, what are they going to say? So, Mossy, go ahead. Uh, Sean Sullivan, for what it's worth, called it a Burhalter masterclass last night and said the fact that he started Tyler Adams in Giorena reflected the fact that he has big balls. <laughs> I don't know how big his balls are. I mean, I think so, some of this kind of wrote itself. Um, and it gets back to, you know, form is fallacy, my friend. We want to go there? Yeah, I mean, I just want to pin down exactly what form is fallacy <laughs> means. It, it certainly applies with Gio because okay. he's somebody whose form has been criticized. And so that spoke to the fact that however poorly a guy might be playing at club level, um, he can still show up for the national team and do well. But you tried to apply it to Tyler Adams. Yeah. And to me, that's no form. A guy being injured doesn't really apply. You just, you just told me how there is a sentiment out there that starting Tyler Adams was this ooh, ah type of thing. And if that's the case, why? Well, because this is a guy who hasn't played. And so my question to you is, is, is someone that has bad form that is playing, okay, worse or better than someone that has no form at all because he's not playing? Either way, I look at it as, this is form, okay? And his form in this situation is fallacy in that he started a guy who has not been playing soccer. So both cases fit under the general umbrella of form is fallacy. They, yes, they definitely but you would agree. The quintessential examples yes. are guys that are playing poorly at club level. Absolutely. My, my point is that we cannot always judge what is happening at the club level, whether they are playing and playing poorly, or by the way, whether they are playing and playing well, or in this case, they're not even playing at all. We can't just use that and say, well, that's going to happen immediately when they get into camp. And I think Tyler Adams, in a strange way, was also trying to you know, talk about that here in that they don't have a whole lot of time. And so whatever history you have, whatever organization you have already put in place, it becomes that much more, more valuable. And again, it's, it's against Mexico. So we temper all of this with, uh, with that. But uh, Greg Berhalter, I think, deserves credit and praise for doing things that people disagreed with um, and doing things that people didn't or and or doing things that people didn't expect in this moment and it worked out. And even if Tyler Adams had not scored the goal, it was still it still ended up being the right decision to have him uh, start this game. And certainly when it comes to Gio Reyna, I think it was the right decision specifically in this game against Mexico. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops twice a week right here on my very own YouTube page. The only way to stay up to date is to hit that subscribe button down below. Size the day and see you soon.